Epithet Erased is an animated action comedy web series. It was created by the YouTuber Jello Apocalypse or Brendan Blabber for Verve. It's also one of the greatest animated series I've ever watched. The show is set in a universe where everybody speaks the same language. Because of this, words literally have power. These powers are known as epithets, and they're imprinted into the souls of one out of five individuals when they're born. Those born with epithets are called the inscribed, while those born without an epithet are called Mundies. They grant the inscribed magical powers based on the word that their epithet represents. Epithets are, of course, one of the show's biggest draws. Because of the versatility of how language can be used, the show can be endlessly creative with how the characters' powers work. The words can be stupid and their powers even stupider, like this man's epithet, which is soup. That being said, even words you wouldn't expect to be useful, such as the main character's dumb, can be pretty insane. Um, hi. I dumbed down your attack? Before we get into the characters and plot though, we need to address Epithet Erased's unique style of animation. While the show is technically animated, it's a bit more akin to a visual novel. It uses character sprites which alternate from pose to pose, instead of actual frame by frame animation. Because it's a loose adaption of Brendan's anime campaign, these tabletop RPG sessions that he'd stream with his friends on Twitch, the show actually incorporates game elements such as HP and stamina. It may sound strange, but it genuinely blends together so well into a perfect cocktail of incredibly enjoyable insanity. The budget for the show was only 300k. To put that into perspective, South Park, another show with limited animation, costs 250k to produce per episode. Some people call this style of animation lazy. If anything, I'd say this show went above and beyond with how much mileage it got out of that budget. The visuals are never static, it's full of life through the means of clever and inventive editing and gorgeous character art. To make up for the visual shortcomings, there's also some awesome tabletop RPG style narration. She grabs a box of thumbtacks off the secretary's desk and chucks them across the floor. The voice actors totally captivate you with their performances, and it makes the whole thing a lot more immersive. We also actually do get two fully animated scenes for the climaxes of the show's two arcs, and they're beautiful. With all of that out of the way, let's finally dig into the show itself. So, Epithet Erased is split into two arcs. The first one is the Museum Arc, which spans the first four episodes. The second one is the Western Arc, which spans the last three episodes. Yes, there's only one season and seven episodes. I'm sad about it too. The first one kicks off when the mysterious Mira, with the help of her himbo lackey Indus, initiates a heist for the powerful Arsene Amulet, and it extremely powerful relic that can steal anybody's epithet. You'd think they'd keep this thing a little safer than lying around in a museum, but whatever. The main protagonist of this arc is Molly Blindef. Blindef as in blind and deaf, a pun on her epithet being dumb. This show is very punny, and I love it for that. While she can do tamer stuff like mute things, she can also dumb down people or objects. It's pretty neat. She falls asleep in the museum during a tour, waking up to find herself in the middle of the heist. While she may look as cute as a button, she's actually super cynical, and I greatly enjoy the contrast between her cutesy design and her tendency to be a little depressing. I wrote my last will and testament because life is fleeting and you never know when you or a loved one will die. Despite her snark, though, she is incredibly sweet and kind-hearted. You can see where she gets her cynicism from when we meet her arsehole father, Martin. He's a selfish idiot who works his daughter to the bone in their family store, the Blind Deaf Toy Emporium. Apparently her sister is even worse, yikes. Her arc is learning to be assertive and speak up for herself, which is very clever with her epithet's definition being the inability to talk. During the heist, an evil organisation known as the Bonsai Blasters infiltrates the museum to carry out their own heist. Strangely, they couldn't care less about the amulet. They're much like Team Rockets, except somehow even more lame, and that's why I love them. This specific group of blasters is led by the endlessly boisterous Giovanni Potage. Giovanni is one of my favourite characters. Sure, he's obnoxious, but in a funny way, trust me. My 
Loitering is a perfectly respectable crime that can be very dangerous. Despite his insane levels of confidence, he has no idea what he's doing at any given point in time. Same. He acts evil, but he's always hyping up his team and being a good friend on main. He meets Molly inside the museum, and after the two are captured together by Indus, they quickly agree to team up and stop the amulet falling into Mira's clutches. He makes Molly his right-hand minion, as his original ones get captured, giving her the blaster alias of Bear Trap. His epithet is Soup, yeah. He overcompensates for this by giving his attacks hardcore names, such as calling the soup mist he can create the Fog of Lost Souls. It's brilliant. Molly and Giovanni's relationship is definitely the highlight of this arc for me. Giovanni's overconfidence rubs off on Molly as he teaches her to be assertive. You can tell they care for each other, despite only just meeting. They're also an incredibly fun comedic duo, with Gio being extremely emotive and Molly being extremely deadpan. And if you recruit enough people, you actually make money! That sounds like a pyramid scheme. Here we have Sylvie. He initially only wanted to have a look at the amulet, but he's tricked into thinking Molly and Gio are the real thieves by Mira. However, they quickly become allies after sorting out the big misunderstanding. I mean, in his defense, he isn't exactly wrong about Gio, but anyway. He's a genius kid psychiatrist, and this sort of gives him this pompous and arrogant attitude. Sylvie's epithet is one of my favorites, Drowsy. This allows him to turn whatever he dreams up real, and this Scottish Minotaur man is kinda hot, not gonna lie. I guess his dreams are just like mine. Alright, now though, let's get into the real best part of the arc. The villains, obviously. This is Indus. He's the most himbo himbo who ever himboed. He's great. There's this reoccurring gag that he's not meant to be sharing his epithet barrier, but he mentions it literally every second and it kills me every time. My epithet is BARRIER! <laughs> Oh, you've got my attention. Now, like every good himbo, he's not actually evil, simply dangerously stupid. He cares about Mira, and will do anything for her. You know, much like Kronk and Yzma, except better. Yeah, I said it. Yes, it's finally time to talk about Mira. A pretty Sundere and a tragic backstory, my two biggest weaknesses. Her epithet is fragile, and it does exactly what it says on the package. Except, here's the twist. The stronger her epithet becomes, the more fragile she herself becomes. She's in constant agony, creaking with every movement and even breaking her own bones. I like her a lot too because she truly demonstrates the range of potential that epithets really have. Despite only appearing for four episodes, she's fully fleshed out. The show does a marvellous job of making you feel bad for her while still having her gaslight and gatekeep like a girl boss. Let me tell you, the end of her arc had me in tears, in a sad way, unlike the rest of the arc. For the first First time in a long while, Mira doesn't feel anything. Before we move on, can I just say how much I love these designs? Like, holy crap, have you ever seen such a visually appealing cast of characters? Sylvie has gotta be my favourite. I love his dream cloud motif and colour scheme. The lead designer was Ray Burnham, who did such a terrific job of capturing the personalities and epithets of the cast and translating them visually into their designs. The original soundtrack is also just superb. Apparently composed by Plaster Brain, Brendan's sister, who I mainly know for Nimbasa Core, as it was the outro theme for Jello's classic videos. She also did the theme song for the show, which, in my opinion, is one of the most iconic theme songs in animation of all time. It does a wonderful job of getting you hyped for each episode. Epithet erased. Anyway, now let's move on to the Western arc. This one sees Giovanni travel to the small town of Redwood Run in order to get the arson amulet evaluated by Ramsey, a notorious appraiser and con artist. However, Percy the police detective is hot on his trail after he managed to escape from her clutches during last time at the museum. So, who are our heroes? Percy is severely lacking in social skills, not quite understanding people's actions or motives. As such, she puts all her faith in the justice system 
to dictate her actions. It's kind of charming in a way, and her bluntness and naivety makes for some great comedy. Her epithet is Parapet. This one is kind of strange, allowing her to erect tiny buildings that have different effects depending on what kind of building she creates. For instance, when she creates an Apoca 3, it has the ability to heal wounds. It makes sense when you take into consideration the RPG elements. Ramsey Murdoch is a criminal that voluntarily lives in the town jail. Why, you ask? Nobody would think to search for him there. Honestly, smart. See? It's like a vacation. He's not an awful person per se, just a bit sleazy. While he definitely does have the capacity to do nice things, he's always looking out for himself. His epithet is Gold Bricker, which allows him to turn anything he touches into gold, even himself. Is it bad I find him hot? Yes? Okay, let's move on. Unfortunately, his peace in prison doesn't last forever after he's found by Zora, a bounty hunter. As she's looking for the amulet though, she allows him a head start to find a new hiding place. Ramsey eventually bumps into Percy, and with him being a criminal and her being a police officer, the rat man is forced to hide his true identity after Percy enlists his help. I personally loved their dynamic together. It's always fun seeing someone comedically try to hide the truth so that they don't get caught, and being forced to do things that they really don't want to do. Let me just write down a little note for myself, totally unrelated. You can make gold, you can morph gold, you can turn yourself into gold, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. So who are the villains for this arc? The secondary antagonists of this arc are these two goons. God, I hate them so much. They're blasters, but they outrank Geo, with Geo only being a Banzai captain, while they're Banzai vice principals. Yes, the naming conventions for the roles in this organization are odd to say the least. They spot the arson amulet and bully Giovanni into giving it to them before the one that had it is babelitied by Zora. Speaking of which, let's finally discuss the real antagonist, Zora. While Mira was merely misunderstood, Zora is just a strange straight up unhinged badass. Presumably, we don't actually have a backstory for her yet to my knowledge. Her epithet, Sundial, gives her the ability to accelerate or reverse the timeline of its targets. OP stuff, but her cookiness is her biggest weakness, and she winds up being outsmarted by her unlikely duo. Nope, still fun, I'm having a ball. This showdown might be the best part of the entire series. It's extremely intense, and the animated scene makes it all the more satisfying. So is that it? Not quite. At the end of each arc, we're teased with the overarching build-up of Bliss Ocean, a Monday terrorist group whose currently no members include Zora, Pikachu, Gajinka, and Terezi Pyro from Homestuck. To be continued, huh? Oh boy, that sounds so interesting. I can't wait to watch season two and oh god damn it. Yeah, there's no plans for season two, but don't panic. Brendan has been slaving away at making a sequel in the form of a book, which has already been sent off to editors. The dude has been working on this thing non-stop, and I can guarantee you from looking at his constant Twitter updates that it's going to be awesome. We're getting designs for the characters and everything, which you can check out on his Patreon. And hey, if the book does well, there's apparently a chance of it getting an animated adaption, just so long as Brendan can make up the funds for it. Go sub to him right now. Please, I beg you. I want it! I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it! If you enjoyed this video, it'd be greatly appreciated if you could give it a like, and be sure to subscribe for more videos like it. So, what would your epithet be? Tell me in the comment section down below, and hey, even feel free to tell me what animated series you want me to cover next. Be sure to join my Discord, follow me on Twitter, and subscribe to my Patreon, links in the description. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.